I'm going to show you how to test your mass airflow sensor, otherwise known as your MAF. This test will only be applied to the 2.0 liter automatic, uh, 93 to 95. This will not be for the manual transmission because the manual transmission has a VAF or a vane airflow meter, also known as a volumetric airflow meter. Completely different test. Um, so for everyone that has a 93 to 95 MAF, you're going to learn something new. Here's the specification in the 1994 troubleshooting manual for the automatic 2.0. Your terminal voltage, when the ignition is turned to the on position, not start, should be zero volts. I've done that. I'm getting zero volts, so we're good on that test. The next is at idle. Now, this test has to be performed when your car has a proper base idle, and that would be 750 to 800 RPM. Unfortunately, I have a very high idle right now, probably about twice what the specification is, so I don't expect this test to show me a true accurate result. But you should be getting... 0.6 to 0.7 of a volt. On page F3-160 of the 94 troubleshooting manual, it's not going to show you where the pins are or what pins to test. For that, you are actually going to need the 95 wiring diagram. And again, this is for the FS automatic because I'm running the automatic ignition system even though I have a manual transmission. Don't let that part fool you. For all intents and purposes, we are testing an automatic today. So it says connect the voltmeter to the breakout box terminal 50 and 9. And what this does is a breakout box is a Mazda special tool that has the PCM connector. You unhook the PCM connector and you would connect up this breaker, this breakout box. And basically this just lets the technician test or back probe from this box. Um, but for our test, we were just we're just going to back probe the correct MAF signal wire. And it tells you that the correct MAF signal wire is going to be terminal 50. So we come over to the wiring diagram, the mass airflow. Terminal 50 is going to be a pink wire with a black lead. Your so that means that the other side of this circuit is going to be the blue wire with the yellow lead. We're just going to concentrate on this wire. This is your signal wire. And here's the mass airflow sensor. You can see I have a T-pin stuck right here, and that is a pink wire with the black lead. And the other return signal wire would be the one directly next to it, which is a black wire with the blue lead and the second wire over. But we're not going to use that. We're just going to use the pink and black. The T-pin does not go into the wire. There is a, a rubber grommet surrounding the wire. And so you have to get this through the rubber grommet, which acts as a waterproof seal. And then you just kind of stick that in there and make sure that no other metal is touching, especially down on your lead here. Then you would connect this up to the positive lead of your multimeter. Here we have the negative, and I'm just going to use the hood latch as the negative. And we're getting zero, so that's good. So now we're going to start the car, run the car. It doesn't have to warm up, you just have to idle. So you don't have to wait around along to, for this test. You just turn the car on, let it idle for a couple seconds, and then you come and check this. Now we have the car running, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna ground this circuit out. I'm going to see what happens over here. So I'm running really high because of my high idle, like I said. And that's about right. That's about right. That's about what I would expect. So that's going to be about 1050 to 1100 RPMs. You can see it's dropping out, the signal's dropping out. So anywhere between, I'm going to say 1100 RPMs to 13 or 1400 RPMs. I know that's a wide range for this idle condition. So I'm at 1294, bearing between 1294 to 10. See, I'm getting a little bit of fluctuation here. I'm not quite liking that. This is the kind of thing I would want a lap scope for. If this was not fluctuating, I would not want more need a lap scope. But because this has some fluctuation in it, I'd want to see a waveform pattern off of this. You might want to take it to professional. To me, it's a little high, just a hair high. See, when it dips down to 13, that's okay. For my RPM condition, I think 13 would be okay. I think 14 point something is going to be a little too high. So we might have a, a little bit of a math issue here. It's not going to be much. Uh, it'll still idle okay. I mean, as you can see, I'm not getting a, a large fluctuating idle anymore. But yeah, I mean, look how quiet it is now. 
My power steering isn't groaning anymore. Everything sounds good. No knocking, no pinging. There's a little slight vibration to it, not much. Everything seems to be running a lot better now. Like I said, just knock out the issues one at a time. Take them step by step by step and you'll eventually knock out your issues if you have determination. Well, I just got back from my test drive and my idle was so much better. The MAF sensor on my original MAF sensor was way better than that junkyard sensor that I picked up. A uh, huge, huge difference. And I didn't do anything else other than swap out the MAF sensor. If you have a high idle fluctuation condition, I would recommend looking at your MAF sensor. Clean your MAF sensor. I have a video on how to clean your MAF sensor. And now you have a video on how to test your MAF sensor as well. I didn't actually test the old MAF either. I'm just going on my drivability issues. Right now, the car it drives great. It's enjoyable to drive again. The highest it idled was at 2,000 RPMs, and that was only for a second after I touched the gas. So I can snap throttle it again without it staying high. So it, previously, if I snap throttled it, it would go up to 3,000 and stay, and that's just if I blipped it. Let's just say if I blipped the throttle, it would climb up to 2,000. If I blipped it again while it was at 2,000, it would climb up to 4,000 and stay at 4,000 permanently. I'm guessing that's a symptom of a bad math or mass airflow sensor. So I'm as of right now, I'm calling this one fixed. I still haven't done enough testing to conclusively say that it's fixed, but my guess is just from my initial drive, it's looking really, really good. That was a very enjoyable, and my car did warm up. I did let it warm up before I even left the driveway, so I'm pretty happy with the results of this test. I don't think my MAF sensor is perfect. I think that it's still kind of glitchy, but it's within spec, and it's drivable, enjoyable drivable, compared to a bad MAF sensor, which makes a highly unenjoyable driving experience with that real high idle. Uh, I didn't have to adjust my idle speed at all. So I'm pretty happy about that. I might adjust it down just a tad because I'm, I'm, I still am high idling. I'm idling at around 1100. So I'm gonna try and adjust my idle down. But you know, that might be, uh, that might actually end up being another video. So uh, I'm just gonna come out with a whole bunch of little short, quick clips today as I'm working on the car. This is a factory workshop manual from Mazda. This is what the Mazda dealerships are given. You can now get these free at pmx626.info if you're a 626 MX6 Ford probe owner. And if you're a probe owner, about 75% of this is going to be exact is going to exactly match your car. You will get a lot out of something like this as well. It's not going to all be match, but as far as the engine bay is concerned, you're going to get about 75% all the same exact procedures in a factory manual. If you don't want a factory manual or you don't have access to it, at least pick up a hands repair manual. Or if you're elsewhere in the world, you might want to get a Chilton's. I've heard good things about Chilton's. Chilton's is usually in Europe. Uh, Haynes is mostly North America. And on the Haynes manual, as you can see here, it says 1993 to 2001. This also goes for the 2002 model. Don't worry. If it's faulty, you're going to have to replace it. And those things are expensive, yes. So make sure that you test it and you ensure that it's faulty before you replace parts. One thing that I hate seeing is people just throwing parts at the problem and just replacing crap ad hoc to try and get rid of one particular issue that's really nagging them. And then they end up spending like $200 in parts and their issue is still there. Diagnose your issue, test, test, test some more, and then fix the part. Get evidence. Like uh, Real Fixes Real Fast says, gather evidence, find the culprit, fix it. One part. I hope that you've learned something from this issue, and if I've helped you, please let me know, because I like hearing stuff. I like hearing positive stuff back. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the box below. Enjoy the road.